I'm on the air with Sam. Real talk with Mike Burke. Sam, what's your last name? Lauren. Lauren? Yeah. Yeah. Where are you from? So, born in Latvia. Latvia? Mm -hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah. Where's Latvia? Latvia is one of the Baltic countries. So, it's next to Estonia, Lithuania, Finland, Sweden, right next to Russia. Next to? Yeah. I like yeah. that. So, you speak Russian? Well, I speak Russian. But nowadays, you got to clarify that. You're not Russian. Yeah, I speak Russian. You speak Russian. Yes. What other languages do you speak? Um, because I speak Russian, I understand Belarusian. I understand Ukrainian. They share a lot of similar um, words. Um, com almost completely forgot Latvian. Learned English here. Um, now I'm dabbling a little bit in Spanish. Yeah, I'm trying to pick up some Spanish myself. I took it in high school, but um, it's... It needs to be more fluent. I need to be around someone who speaks Spanish every day. We're, we only speak Russian to our kids right now okay. just to help them develop that cognitive part of their brain so they later on they're not going to struggle with that. I think the United States is so behind because when I went to Croatia, the guide that I had on my tour was speaking like three or four languages. And other countries speak multiple languages. A U.S. You can always tell a, U a U.S. citizen. Oh, gosh. They only speak one language. So if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. <laughs> if you speak two, you're bilingual. If you speak one, you're only American. You're American. <laughs> exactly. And it's it's like that. It's like it's our way or the highway. If you yeah. don't know English, well, good luck. Yeah, good That's luck. That's your problem. Yeah. It's just like the dollars, the universal uh, yeah. you know, money, currency. And then you've got English is probably the world's language, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So you're from Latvia. When did you move here? 99 my parents won the green card um, <clears throat> they won it mm -hmm. what does that mean basically it's a lottery um and uh, you get randomly you, you apply for it and then you get selected once you get selected you go into like these extensive interviews so america america is genius it's it's run it really is run like a like a good company they go they they give this green card lottery to all these countries and then they pick and choose who they allow to come in. That's why if you look at the Olympic team, it looks like team earth, not even, you know, team USA because there's whites, blacks, Hispanics, Asian. Asians, yeah. and they're all American. Right. Um, so that's, that's basically how, how they go about it. Um, so you go into these interviews, they see what you're about. They want to make sure that when you're going to come here, you're going to benefit us. You're going to be productive citizens. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. So this was in 1999. Mm -hmm. And what did your dad do for work? When we came here, <laughs> we came here with two suitcases. Two suitcases. Mm -hmm. One had all our clothes. The other one had my father's literature. His literature. He had a hundred bucks in his pocket. Hundred books. Bucks. Bucks. I'm one, sorry. $100 in his pocket. He had pocket. $100 in his pocket. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In U.S. currency. Yes. We, we um, exchanged mm -hmm. before you got here. Yeah. And came. it was you, your dad, and who else? My sister. And my mom was pregnant seven months. No way. Yeah. A couple more weeks farther along, they wouldn't <clears throat> let us fly. So we, we, we made it. You just barely made it. Yeah, yeah. And what did he do when he got here? Um, we li we lived with our cousins. Um, they, they they let us stay. And so then, you had relatives here. Yeah, in the, in Charlotte. No, this was New York. Oh, in New York. Yeah. And then he went. He got a job uh, working at a metal fabricating factory. Um, the degrees that you get overseas mean nothing here. So um, just basically start over. Um, and then that's basically what we did is just my mom started uh, cleaning offices, uh, just commercial cleaning. Um, and then dad did metal fabricating, lived there for two years. Um, and then one of his friends said, hey, I have a job here in, in Charlotte. We, he only had like one friend here in America. And we came to Charlotte not knowing any, anybody either. Wow. And, what, and when did you get to Charlotte? This was 2001. 2001. Lived in. Well, the thing about growing up poor is you don't really feel like you're growing up poor until you grow up and look back and realize other people grew up different ways, you know? Uh, so I was, I was very blessed and, and never felt like I couldn't have something. 
It's just in our household, if you wanted something, you just work and you get it. There you was, work, you save. Yeah. There was no begging parents. Parents didn't ruin your summer, none of that. How old, how old were you? How old when I won? When you came here. Seven old? years old. You were seven. And then you got to New York for two years. Mm -hmm. Got to Charlotte when you were 11. Yes. And then after that, what you went to school. Where'd you go to school? Uh, Cochrane. Cochrane Middle School, okay. Northridge. Okay. Um, and then uh, cut grass. I don't know, neighborhoods. Good. I had a push mower yeah. and rollerblades. There you go. So I would mark it around on my rollerblades, and then the next day I would. Good for you. Push that mower more. So your dad, when he got to Charlotte, what did he do here? Same thing, metal fabricated. Metal fabricated. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you graduated high school, and then what did you do? What was your first job? First, first job was Subway. Okay. Worked there for two weeks. You didn't like it. They didn't like me. They didn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't I don't blame him. I would have fired myself too. Okay, got yeah. it. Looking back. He said, I look at the cameras, I'm fast forwarding and you're in that one spot the whole time. What am I paying you for? Yeah. I told him, Good question. <laughs> hey. That was wrong. You answer. learned. You learned, yeah. right? Yeah. So then what was next? Next, um, went to college, um, or applied for college. Um, wanted to be a physical therapist. Okay. I'm two credits away from joining the PTA program. And I ain't going back. You're not going back? No, sir. What happened? No, no, no. So uh, got married or yeah, yeah, got married. Um, and then I was still in college and somebody asked me to, to work for a cell phone repair store. And it was called what? Um, you break we fix or something? No, no. It's, it's down in South Carolina. Worked for them for, for two years. Met you at that time. At the gym. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And so you were fixing cell phones mm -hmm. for someone else. Yeah. And how did you learn? Did you just YouTube, trial yeah. and error? Basically, yeah. Kind yeah. of self-taught. Yeah. This yeah. guy had a store in South Carolina. Where in South Carolina? Uh, Indian land. <clears throat> in yeah. Indian land. Yeah. And you would go there and uh, what was a day like in uh, Indian land at this cell phone repair shop? What was a day? Walk me through a day. Yeah, for pretty, I mean, it's it's retail. So you, you, you come in. Um, anybody that comes in and needs something repaired uh, you explain to them what needs to be done take it in the back um, fix it usually take like half an hour to an hour hmm. and it's 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 all self-taught in, in this industry it's ever evolving so you never just learn it and you're good to go well yeah, how many phones did you get back together that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the stress sweat smells different. The stress you know, sweat. You know what I'm yes, saying? Yes. Yeah. It's not cardio sweat when you're stressing. Yeah. 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 So um, one of the jobs I had in while I was in college was installing cabinets as construction. Okay. So it's and it was usually new construction. So there's no ventilation. I mean, you're 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 going through a couple of shirts a day. And if you get tired, there's no such thing as taking a break. So you go sweep. You go that's, sweep. Uh -huh. That's taking a break. That's taking a break. Now sweeping is like the most labor intensive thing we do all day. Wow. If you sat around for too long, I better get up and do something. Do so some sweeping. Get the blood moving. <laughs> yes. So you sit down at a desk mm -hmm. with these little tiny, do you have uh, magnifying glasses? Do you have anything that you can see better with? No, no. I was, I was blessed with very good vision. Um, if you do need that, you, you can put on um, some magnifiers. But the typical, typical repairs, it's just done with uh, little precision tools. And um, unless you get into micro soldering, which is like board level repairs, then you do um, per, uh, do that under the microscope. Right. And you started doing cell phone repair when you were what, 20, 21? I'm bad with dates around there. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then you worked there two years. Yeah. Yeah. And how many phones would you repair a day? Three, three to 10. Three to ish, 10? Ish, yeah. And what, what's an average repair cost? Repair costs. Mm, 62 probably two hundred dollars so the phone glass is what breaks correct on the front what about the back does the back break too back they introduced later like the first one with the back glass <clears throat> was an iphone 8. okay so if your if your iphone is able to charge wirelessly it has a glass on the back on the back and those break yeah oh yeah and so you replace sometimes the back and the front yeah what's yeah. that cost um, well, it depends the way you do it. You can just separate the glass from the back and glue it back on. If you want to kind of do it right, in my opinion, uh, you do like a housing replacement. So um, 
there there's pros and cons to both uh more cost efficient is there's like lasers laser machines that you put the uh, phone on and it uh, breaks up that adhesive that holds that glass and then you can chip away at it clean the frame put the new glass on and adhere it it that works if your frame is perfect if, as you can imagine you have a perfectly flat gra glass with like a if you have bends in the frame there's going to be a gap Got it. so th the proper way to do this is to take the screen off take all the small components out and put it into a new housing which already has the glass and all of it right that way when you close it up the way we like to do it is you, you shouldn't be able to tell a phone has ever been worked on before that's how, how that's how that's the level we hold ourselves to does it devalue the phone like if if you ever want to resell the phone and it's been repaired does it like a car that's been wrecked and then mm -hmm. you get it painted you know it devalues the car you know on the carfax yeah, yeah. you know there's no such thing as an iphone having a record of being taken apart and put back together like a salvage title yeah um if it's done through a like a major refurbisher like say a Shurion, they do stamp that on the back um but generally no and if it's done correctly, um, you you don't really lose anything from that. Do you think Apple's ever going to one day make a phone that doesn't need repairing? Absolutely not. Oh no, there's there's a lot of money to be made in that. For them too, it's a consumer market. Yeah, Everything. But, but I'm just saying, like you know, you got Apple, big powerful company, says, you know what, we're sick of all these other guys fixing our phones. We're going to make a titanium, you know, bulletproof, you know, glass. No. No, there, no, there's too much money to be made in that. On, on opposite, what they'll do is they'll go with a subscription based. So you no longer own your iPhone. Okay. You just pay it off. You pay monthly to have the ability to use it. Right. And whenever a new one comes out, you just go trade it in. Correct. Correct. That's so where it's going. That that that's how will they that how will they be able to monopolize this and completely cut out the repair industry? Keep the okay. Do you think that's ever going to happen? Um. It's it's going there one day. Yeah, yeah. There's we're never we never <clears throat> we never sleep and think. Is we got iPhone this. is iPhone the phone that gets repaired the most? Absolutely. What, in what America, o, what other phones get repaired? Uh, second one would be Samsungs. Okay. Third would be Google Pixels, and then LG's Motorola. Is What's the most expensive phone to fix? Probably the Samsung Fold. You seen that yeah. one? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a weird phone. Yeah. I don't like it. It's a party trick. It's a, yeah. Yeah. I got it. It's for those guys that need the latest and greatest. Yep. You know. How did you and I meet? How did we meet? I have a video of how we met. No. Mm -hmm. Well, no, how, not how we met, but like a couple of days after that. Really? Mm hmm So I was, um, I joined Lifetime. Yep. And I decided um, I wanted to learn, um, or my dad wanted to teach me how to um, hit the bag. Oh, that's right. So my old man used to be a boxer. Yeah. That, that's what he did when he was younger. I remember that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you came up to me being Mike Burke, <laughs> and you were very polite about it. Like, listen, I, I love the enthusiasm, love the energy, but here's what you can improve on. So you started basically bringing mitts to um this was like the yeah the pads yeah Holding pads they hated us they hated they, us we're making so much noise well they wanted to like stretch there they wanted to have classes and right. mike burke is just making noise that's my gym that's, i do whatever i want to do yeah. i'm paying monthly to be there and then realize that when you have a gym membership that you can't do everything you want to do because the trainers have access to everything and they can block off the room and they can do whatever they want mm -hmm. but we can't do whatever we want mm -hmm. um but it was it was fun for a little while the uh, but yeah I forgot we held pads together yeah that's how we did met. you learn anything absolutely yeah I, I have to show you the video still it's of me man, and you yeah doing 50, 50 pounds ago <laughs> <laughs> you were lighter yeah yeah you put on some size now yeah. how old are you now I'm 31 get out of here yeah four kids deep what yeah four kids deep too mm -hmm. wow yeah. I met you when you were just getting married you just got married you just got married and we were we were expecting so that's it was a crazy. big scary world I can't believe that. I, that I'm glad you reminded me of that I couldn't believe like that story is now coming back to me it's like I forgot how we met yeah so we met at the gym and I was holding I walked up to you and be like hey bro I know you're hitting the bag but um if you want to hit some real mitts and let me show you what to do yeah yeah but you're very, you're very encouraging enthusiastic about it it was fun yeah and the thing with a lot of um athletes especially boxing is one of my favorite things to do and you know martial arts has always been something i enjoyed i don't have a lot of partners 
that want to hold pads for me. Mm -hmm. I have to have trained professionals. Um, I hit pretty hard and I'm, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I have lots of training. The, the, the flip side is, is when I can have an opportunity to hold pads for someone, that's a great workout for me. Mm -hmm. Cause I have to pay attention. I have to call out the ones, the twos, the threes, the hooks, the uppercuts. And I'm constantly moving my hands. I'm constantly moving. So I'm boxing with you. Mm -hmm. And finding someone I can hold pads with is actually reinforcing my skills, reinforcing my training. And I'm sweating and I'm putting out energy and it's a good workout for myself. Oh yeah. So a lot of times when I was reaching out to people that like to box and I wanted to hold mitts, they think, oh, Mike's being such a nice guy. No, 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 I had something in it for me. <laughs> I wanted to get a good workout. Sure. And uh, get the cardio going, yeah. get the wind going. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, I remember talking to you a couple times at the gym and you had came up to me and said something about wanting to rent a building in Monroe. Mm-hmm, yes. Isn't that right? Yes, yes, yes. Tell, walk me through that. Um, you were one of the few people I had in my life at that time that did anything of that nature of having multiple stores, self-employed, you know, you, you had an operation going. So I, I really had not a lot of people to go off of. I, all I knew was this nine to five wasn't cutting it. My wife is about to give birth. So her income is no longer part of the picture. I had to do something. So um, and as every man looks at their um, skill set, you kind of evaluate, what can I do? Everyone thinks about that. Everyone, you know, kind of goes over what I'm good at this. I might be good at that. What can I do? Um, so I, I, I knew how to fix phones. Somebody taught me that. Um, physical training wasn't going there. Personal training, I did that for a little bit. That wasn't, you know, I, I didn't see myself scaling there. So I, I saw a, uh, a building in Monroe uh, that was up for lease they wanted a lot of money for it but it, it met a lot of the criteria and i reached out to you because i knew you had a store in monroe right um and you said monroe is dead or it's dying don't do it and i thought you're a hater <laughs> I'm, well the thing is i'm from mint hill originally and matthews mint hill seems to have more of the following mm -hmm. and i'm not going to say this in a negative way but it's more fluent and monroe was a really good market for me in window tinting. But what we saw in seven, eight years of owning a business in Monroe is we saw the trend mm -hmm. and it was two weeks of good sales and two weeks of bad sales. And what we've found out is it's a working class town that got paid almost every two weeks. So you can almost see the cycles of the pay cycle of when people spent money and then when people didn't spend money because there's more of your, I'm not saying blue collar, but like your, they still have like, um, plants where people are working at chicken houses. They have, you know, you really look at the infrastructure of Monroe and it's still what I consider somewhat a dated, um, area. Yeah. And I love it. Don't get me wrong. I'm a country boy mm -hmm. at heart yeah. and that's a great life. They're great people. But as far as your very first business, starting it in an area that is as not as affluent, um, the home values are not quite as high as Mint Hill Matthews, um, your income of the working class are a little less in Monroe versus Matthews Mint Hill. So I would always talk to people in Monroe and they would be driving to Matthews all the time mm -hmm. for a lot of the things, Indian Trail, Matthews. So I think Indian Trail is kind of the cutoff um, right there. And then once you get into the heart of Monroe, you're you're battling um, the infrastructure of of that area. Yeah. And for someone that is from here, um, I was trying to give you some good knowledge and be like, you got to go where it's more populated. The population equals you know, walk-ins e equals traffic. Um, and then you have access to more um, diverse people. Um, I wouldn't say Monroe would be a bad area. I'd say it'd be okay, but not for your first store. Oh, 100%. I say your second, third store. Yeah, absolutely. You can get a small location. Now you have the uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but walk me through what we talked about and uh, what you did. Well, as I said, you, you were a hater. 
in my mind. Oh, hater you, of Monroe. I'm not a hater of Monroe. No, 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 no. Of me, of me. Here I was I, a hater of you? Here I am. No, no. What? I'm, I'm okay. joking, but okay, here it. I was. I had this brilliant plan. I had a perfect location, and, and Mike is just pooping all over it. I'm pooping yeah. on your parade. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I had to reevaluate. Then, um, at the, as, as it turned out, at the perfect time, you reacquired one of your OG spots yeah. back in Lightning Mics. Yep. So I, I didn't know you back then when you were Lightning Mike. Now you're slow Mike. I'm old Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you, you, you came up and said, here's an opportunity. If you'd like, we can go in this together. We can split the building half and half or uh, divide it the way it will work for us. Um, you can do your phone repairs on the side. Um, on one side and I'll do the the window tinting and obviously what it doesn't sound very appealing what am I going to be in the back of some store you know here's somebody pressing down um, I can't I can't fly I want to fly um, looking back now that was to call that a blessing would be an understatement um, had I gone with that first plan probably wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today um, but the way the way the knowledge you had and the way you were able to guide me and a lot of that um just i will be forever thankful for that just you needed a coach you had the drive you yeah. had the knowledge you had the willpower you you had everything inside of you it's like you can have the greatest athlete in the world but if you don't get the right coach and get him in the right position that's he never maybe never be a star athlete you know, you look at a lot of great athletes and they get bad coaches. Mm -hmm. It really, I want to see success for everyone. And when I see you're hungry, you're ambitious, you're, you're drive, you're, you're caring and you're passionate, you're happy. A lot of your life, you grew up poor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know a lot of this until now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've briefly, but I didn't go into your past when we became friends. I just knew you as Sam, the guy that fixes cell phones that liked to work out at the gym. Sure. And who was always happy who came in with a positive attitude every day. And I gravitate towards that. So when I see someone that's happy at the gym every day, he's got a positive attitude, it's contagious. You wanna be around those type of people. And in my space mentally, mm -hmm. I don't allow a lot of negative people in my life. Uh, I don't, if they are, I'm trying to coach them quickly to get out of that negativity. And if they just keep going down a path, I'm like, bro, I'll throw you a rope and whenever you wanna climb back up, call me. Um, but you were just always so eager and it was easy to work with you because you were asking me questions and asking me advice. And do you remember some of those questions you used to ask me? At the gym, you were like, all right, so how much is the rent? How much is the power? How much is utilities? And how yeah. much do you think my overhead would be? And do, you know, you kept giving me all these scenarios and I just started paint, painting a picture of what yeah. it would be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you like, it's a great unknown. Um, that was at that time the biggest risk I ever took. Um, but risk is contagious, especially when it's successful. It's kind of like hitting the gas pedal for the first time when you're a teenager. Yeah. And you don't crash. And you're like, you're like, Ooh, I'm gonna do that again. What if I hit it harder? What if I pull the e brake? So that the first step of success really kind of like um, build the next steps forward. But I will say it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Um, especially in the beginning. So basically I gave all the money I had, the, everything I had to my name. And to step a little bit back, um, my wife and I, we got married. This was two years before you and I um, uh, did that first store. So all the money we had was a couple of grand we had left over from our wedding. We had nothing and every month I noticed we're cutting into our savings every single month and nothing's changing. So I knew I had to do something because it, the way it was, tra uh, the trajectory of it was, um, we were gonna end up with nothing. So it wasn't like I had money to spare, so I opened up a business. It's like, listen, if I don't do something now, I'm gonna be in a lot deeper problems later. So gave everything away, uh, or spent everything I had, um, opened up two credit cards, maxed them out, and that's how we got the, the store furniture and just the bare minimum. Right. And the way, and, and you, helped tremendously because like a lot of the graphics a lot of a lot of the signage you didn't even charge me for that um so the, to you might have been like pocket change for me it's like what else can i sell to you know put up a sign in the front right 
And the first couple of first, I, I would say year, it was, it really was paycheck to paycheck. And it was the first year you were grinding, bro. Like you were grinding. You, you were don't looking, know. I do know. Yeah. I watched you. Yeah. You were there every day, sun up, sun down, working late, taking everything you could ever get your hands on. Oh, nobody got turned down. Yep. And if it, you made a profit, you yes. were taking it. And, but that meant I can buy more parts and do another phone later. Right. And every, every month that we pay the bills, we paid our mortgage was like a little miracle. Like we get to stay in our house one more month. You were really thinking that, but it was a wonderful time. I'll tell you that at that time, it didn't feel that way, but looking back, you know, I, I'm a spiritual man, right? That was, I was so close to God. I was so dependent. Like I knew, you know, if, if I don't, if not, nobody walks through those doors and we don't fix anything, you don't make anything, you don't eat, you don't eat, cry me a river, eat what you kill. I always think that workers that are the hardest working workers are the ones that are on commission. You know, yeah. if they feel a little bit of the pain that the owner feels, yeah. they start promoting, they start doing Instagram posts, they start doing TikTok posts, they start understanding that it's not just, I'm going to sit in the corner, play on my phone and get a paycheck. That if you produce and do work, you get a percentage of that work. Yeah, yeah. And the more work you do, the more money you make. And when I sold cars at Toyota, when I got out of college, that just instilled with me. The managers were like, you're on a hundred percent commission. Mm -hmm. If you go three or four days, come up here every day and don't sell a car, you don't make shit, nothing, zero produce or you're fired. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. for seven months, man, I just went out there and grinded and I talked to everybody. And I think that mindset, I'm so very thankful for selling cars mm -hmm. to learn the infrastructure of how to greet a customer, listen to a customer for their needs and wants, what their payments need to be, what kind of car they need to drive. Then they, the financing, I learned banks, buy rates. Um, I learned back end, front end. I learned, you know, how many years you have to finance a car to get to the payment at a certain amount. And it was just very knowledgeable. I think every 21 to 25 year old uh, needs to go sell cars for six months and really learn the art of engaging with other people yeah the social side of it was very good for me it, it i was not the greatest salesperson when i first started but i was eager i was happy i was ambitious and i never turned anybody away i just anybody that walked on that lot i treated like they were the i was the happiest to see them yeah. i was like there's yeah. my paycheck right yeah, there exactly um, so you had to have the same mentality. Absolutely. Every person that you talked to, yep. every person that had a pulse, everyone that had a phone was a potential customer. Yes, yes and no. Here's where I would, I, I guess, slightly disagree with you. Okay. Um, I kind of have this tendency to be brutally honest. I love it. So especially in the beginning, we want a lot of loyalty by turning down or telling folks we're not the best option for them. Oh, and that, explain that to me. What so, does that mean? Meaning if, if somebody comes in and they have something broken and they, hey, I want to fix this. And I look at it and I know, for instance, that could be covered under a manufacturer's warranty. I let them know. And yeah, I could fix it. And yeah, I really need that money. And and sometimes you just you, you can feel the Lord on your shoulder like, what you going to do, Sam? You going to take that or are you going to tell them the truth? So anyway. I would, I would tell them like, I'm not the best option for you in the short term. I lost a customer, but in the long term, that loyalty to this day, to this day, it's, and it's like, it's them, it's their friends, it's their family. Sam's the go-to guy. He will be honest. And, and that I feel like really helped us like in the beginning, I'll tell you another story. Um, this was when I was grinding. I uh, had a lady come in and she had a, it was a cheap phone. Um, uh, repair was only $50. Um, got to know her a little bit, kind of like you do in sales, um, single mother. Um, but, but it, it was $50 repair. So it, it wasn't like, you know, she, she she's not going to eat that month. So I, I do the repair and during the repair, I just, you know, I get this feeling not to charge her. Mike, I need that money, but I have a feeling not to charge her. So 
um, you know, give her the phone, let her know it's on the house. God bless you. If you need anything, let us know. No strings attached, you know. That lady, with all her family to this day, has spent thousands and thousands of dollars at our stores. She ended up getting a different job, turned around. When the latest and greatest phone comes out, hey, Sam, next time you get your hands on one. I want it. I want it. I want to buy it from you. That's awesome. I've told people for years, to get what you want out of life, you got to give. And if you give, you will receive. And what I mean by that is I've given away tent um, to people who I thought had influence. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it off as marketing. Yeah. And the people that don't ask for something for free are the, and they're willing to pay you. And, 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 but you know, when you have that little feeling like this is somebody that I think can mm -hmm. help me in my business and you write it off as marketing. And if more businesses would give a little bit every once in a while, they, like you said, would yeah. get that loyalty. That loyalty pays dividends forever, ever and ever and ever. Yes. And so that's the secret of what you did when you first started is just you would give and be honest. Yes. That yes. was that was the key. Well, there there was a turning point. Um and now I warned you, I am gonna talk about God. Um so, you can a little bit. But it's you can't talk about me without, you know, my, my faith. <laughs> right. Um I especially in the beginning, I I wanted to improve myself in every aspect. Physically, I want to I want to run faster, bench harder, squat deeper. I want to cl eat cleaner. I want to do everything better. I want to read books, better myself. Um, I, I want to pray better. I want I want I want to improve so much. But one thing I never really got on is tithing. It was just like for me, just a bare minimum. I look at what I made that week. All right, here's ten percent. I give it to church, a mission, whatever. And I felt I felt really convicted for that. Um, and this was a time when we had no savings and my wife is like, just bring something home. Bring me 20 bucks a week. We need to start saving. We have nothing because everything was coming in. We were spending on parts to do more repairs. So I started putting away $20 a week. We saved up a little amount. This was, took us a couple of months and I was very proud of that. I got some money saved up and, and, and we hear about this. Um, this couple that needed, needed help. So I tell my wife, let's give it all to them. She looked at me like I just got hit in the head. What are you talking about? I said, I think we should give all of it to them. I said, okay, you make the money. I trust you. So we give it all away. The next Monday, I make that exact amount. Tuesday that exact amount again wednesday you guessed it thursday for five ten dollar differences but you but that next week you went boom 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 that boom. exact amount that's but, lord i hear you so then i started setting goals for tithing 10 percent was just bare minimum how much more can we give and that was the pivoting point where I'm like financially, this doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Give more so you'll have more, but that's what happened. And since then it's just blessings on blessings. What did you start your business off with? Like how much money when you first, including like the, the credit cards? Yeah. Including the credit cards. What did, what did you go in the hole? Like that, that when we, when we were designing the store, it, we gutted it. Yeah. I mean, gutted the whole place and we built you like your little office area, your little showroom area and your yeah. little area. And I incurred the cost because I have the building. Yes. And then you turned around and had to upfit it, put some display counters. You had to get cell phones. You had to get, what did you spend? This was like five or $6,000 for everything. You started your business. No, no, Turn no. key for five or $6,000. Four of that was credit, card. credit cards yeah. and two was what I had yep. left from my wedding. You jumped into a boat with four grand in credit cards mm -hmm. maxed out and two grand cash with no intention to pay them back <laughs> with no intention to pay the credit card company back be like sorry bro you gave me the money full disclosure yeah just last year i ended up paying them back you did yeah yeah what did you gross your first year in sales 
and it was just you. Yeah. You worked in that shop every day oh, by yourself. Yeah, six days a week. Yeah, yeah. grinding. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember. You don't? I don't, but it, w it was pocket change. A hundred grand? Oh, come on. I man. mean, gross sales. Like gross, gross, like I, gross sales. You have a clover. You have a machine. You could probably go hit a button and probably see. What I, I wish you asked me this prior to. I would have had the numbers ready for you. But yeah, it, right. it was. I mean, just give me a rough estimate. Bare minimum. Whatever we needed to, to pay rent, yep. to pay inventory, and have our mortgage paid. Okay. No savings, no investing, none of that. The second year, after you made bare minimum, you were just skating by the first year. Yes. Skating by. Yes. You had enough food on the table, you had your mortgage paid, and you were, you were grinding every day. Yes. What'd you do for advertising, other than being loyal and building clients and referrals and being honest? Driving to carrier stores. Okay. Giving them pizza. Carrier stores like an AT and T, Verizon, the stores that actually sell the phones. Correct. People come in. Hey, we got a broken phone. Yes, got yes. it. So you bring them pizzas. Yes, and our market was like, hey, if somebody comes in and they want to upgrade to a new phone and you don't accept it if it's cracked, send them our way. We'll fix it real quick. You can keep your, you know, keep doing your thing, make your commission, upgrade them to the new phone. Did that work? Oh yeah, absolutely. We so still you get do referrals. That. Yeah, absolutely. We still and it's back to relationships. It's all about relationships. Everything, especially Everything. the managers. Whatever they need personally, you all take the care of them. Hey, if you got a broken friend, buddy, yep, yep, you, yep. Eat, you eat a few. Yep, yep. You give to get, love it. Yep, yep. So that that was the only marketing we could afford. Then next year we we did have a little spare for marketing. Google shut us down as far as the industry goes. They put us in the same market as pawn shops, so we were no longer allowed to pay for advertising. Get out. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. So. Um, then it was just like Facebook ads. I did, and, and literally, I was the janitor, the marketing, the the HR. I remember you calling me asking me what I did at Sunstoppers for marketing, and yeah, um, I have a lot of creative different ways and things like that. I mean, it, it, it just varies. I always say, if you plant enough seeds, you'll eventually grow. You got to keep planting a seed every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was the ROI I was more hung up on because I was so tight on the budget. Like if it wasn't producing that week, yeah, you stopped it. Yeah. I feel like I'm wasting money. Got it. You, you were week to week. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. When did you actually start making some money? Probably third year. Third year. Mm -hmm. Started counting. Um, actually, I, I end up doing this where every every time I do a repair, I go back, I write the cost, the the gross, and the net, and then go off of that. So you have you, you started creating your own internal P&L. Yes. yes. And that gave you some better ideas of what you're really making per phone, per, yes. per transaction. Yes. You started getting knowing. The, the only reason for that? was for my tithing. I needed to know what I'm actually making so to, to see how much I should be tithing or, or giving away. Right. That was, that was the purpose of like even keeping track of it. So like if, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, this is not financial advice. Um, you know, it's, it's just my story. It's and, your faith. It's and, your, and it's your heart. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. go to bed at night, sleep wonderful, knowing that you're being the, the, the giver that you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say like, uh, like we believe blessed and more who gives than who receives. And you of all people know that. Yeah. You, you know, the feeling of blessing. Someone. I love giving. Yes. I give all the time. Mike, how I say you and I see a lot eye to eye. We just have different names for those things. I get it. You know? Sure. I love to give yeah. and there's nothing more rewarding than teaching someone or giving someone an opportunity. And then you see them a year or two or three down the road and, and I'm not saying that you're a, a cousin or a sibling or a son or anything like that, but your success, you know, I wasn't even thinking about having you on the podcast and I saw you at the gym yesterday and I don't see you like I used to because I travel so much mm -hmm. and we used to hang out and see each other at the shop and now it's like I see you a couple times a year and I give you a big hug and love you, man. I miss you. I love you too. And I'm like, and I looked at you yesterday. I was like, I need to have you on the fucking podcast, man. Like, <laughs> you got a great story. Yeah, yeah. So when you determined it mentally to go and open up your own business, mm -hmm. was there, you, you prayed probably. Oh, yeah. And then. Pray and fast. Fasted. Yes. And then where did you come up with like, all right, baby, I'm, I'm going to get a credit card, max it out, and I'm going to use our last $2,000 to open a business. When well, did that come to your brain and actually go, fucking, I'm doing it? Well, my, my wife, she's, she's my life partner. Sure. Um, w without her, I wouldn't be where I am. Um, she's my brakes. She's my steering wheel. Cause you and I were, we're gas. Oh um, yeah. You know, we need somebody to, to, um, we gotta have fuel. We do. 
So before that, I had a lot of ideas. I wanted to do like shirt printing. I wanted to do screen printing. Um, looked, drove around, saw potential businesses that wanted to sell. Um, like like every man, you kind of weigh your options and see what you can do and what and so start to fix phones was honestly the last resort. I didn't want to kind of like start doing what I'm already working on. And then when I mentioned it to my wife, she's like, yes, you know how to do this. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, ever since then, um, just having her, you know, behind me, I'm blessed with a woman who doesn't spend a lot. If anything, now I kind of have to make her treat herself. Right. Um, so even in that aspect, I see a lot of guys where, you know, they're hustling, doing everything right. And then they got, and it's just draining. The wife just doesn't know what else she wants. You've seen that. Oh, it's, it, you go to South Park Mall and you can just sit in the parking lot oh, and watch man. the women go in and out yes. buying stuff and they're not happy. Yes. I feel like the more you buy just miscellaneous things, it feels a simple, it's like a dopamine drop. Mm -hmm. that you get that day that high that you're in the store buying something yeah. and then you go wear that outfit and you wear it once and then all of a sudden that high is gone mm -hmm. um you know i have kids i have two boys and the more time that i spent with my kids the happier they were not what i bought them it's what i did with them the experiences like going out to my land riding four wheelers, riding, you know, dirt bikes, getting a machete. And they would come out of the woods when they're 10, 12 years old. Dad, 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 look what I built. I built a fort and I got, we were in the woods for five hours. I think we had some crackers and some juice boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and these kids like won the lottery. Thriving. I just, I swear if we had video cameras, you see these two kids in the woods with machetes and and people are like, you had your kids with sharp machetes when they're like seven, eight. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They were cutting little trees and little limbs down and they stack them up and they built like, and then he put all this little stuff in it and then they went to the truck and got like some napkins and then they had like the little, it's like, it's like girls playing their little tea parties, you know, with dolls. Boys want to go out in the woods and get dirty and build a little tree house or a little fort. My old man, and I'm, I'm sure your, your father can relate. He brought his uh, his twenty two to school, and they had a place where you hang your rifle. Get cause, out! Because after class, you got shooting. No. Yes. Where Where was this? Latvia. Not what, in the what? U.S., bro. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But don't, there was a time where you know you didn't have to think about those right bad apples. I mean, you're a gun owner. Yeah. Yeah, you believe in the First Amendment, right? Mike, some of the biggest patriots I know are immigrants, is because we all weren't allowed to have guns. Oh no. No, so you get in the U.S. You got to be a like a citizen. You have to be like class three government, whatever. To get access to a gun. Yes, even you're basic. Wow, and you've got a conceal permit. Yes, sir. And you should. You've been out to my land and shot. Yes, you should see the new range. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I love to shoot guns. It's so rewarding. I like skeet now. Skeet seems to be my thing. Skeet, where you throw the yeah, clay, yeah, yeah, clay yeah, pigeons yeah. with yeah, a shotgun yeah. and yeah. shoot it. But what really is enjoyable is going and getting my Henry lever action 22s. And I just fill the barrel. It's like the old kid in you when you're like 10. Yes. And you get the BBs and you put the BB guns in there, and you know. So you take the little tube out and you throw these little 22s in there and you mm -hmm. put them in there and you go put some bottles or whatever across the pond and iron sights. Yes. You know, you're not, yes. no scopes. Yes. And you're over there, plink, and you plink, plink. And it's, you're a kid for like two hours. Yes. yes. <laughs> you yes. spent $20 in uh, 22 ammo. Yeah, I'll bring an AR out there, and I'm like, that was $100 in ammo. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. Yeah, depending on who's president at that time. I, I, I'm like, hey, yeah, this is true. I, I'll tell my friends, yeah, we're going shooting. What guns y'all shooting today? And then I'll bring my guns, but I don't bring the ammo. I'm like, I'm shooting y'all's ammo. Yeah. You're on my land. Yeah. Um, no, that's cool, man. So you're a gun owner. I gave my father, so my, my he's never owned a gun, uh, uh, a real gun. Or, yeah. What'd you give him? The Henry Twenty Two. No, they have these golden boys that are gold plated. So I had a I had a friend uh, hand engrave our yeah. last name I oh, and the coat tough. of arms of Latvia, and that was a very to me a special thing I can do for my dad. Sentimental. Yes, yes. So, He's gonna remember that for the rest of his life. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Have yeah. you taken him shooting? Yeah, we actually been to your land. That's awesome, yeah. man. Good for you. So the third year 
you started to make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. You started saving more. Mm -hmm. And then you now have two locations. Yes. So how did you find your employee uh, that's in your location that you started um, when you transferred? When did you know was the right transition to say, hey, I got to bring someone else in? Did you mm -hmm. just bring him in because you had so much volume you couldn't keep up mm -hmm. like you started to get the volume up to where it's like whoa i can only do 10 phones a day yes and if i want to do 15 phones a day i'm not going to be able to i'm one person so you maxed out what you personally could do yes and and it, and it goes back to another thing you taught me is the is mental capacity mental space yep. I, d I didn't have that if you're in the business you can't grow the business so um i actually bring, brought on my brother um, and it's a blessing and a curse working with family right. blessing. There's no such thing as mistrust. You know, your customers and everything is taken care of curse. What do you can do? Fire brother. They know they can get away with everything. So he does a good job. Oh, he's amazing. He's a good guy. He's amazing. He's not as personable as you, um, as far as outgoingness. I think you're more outgoing. Yeah. Um, but he's very good with customers. He cares. He does. And sometimes that's too much, but you're, you're caring you can show that to the customer and when you show that builds your loyalty yeah yeah and that and he's basically following in your footsteps you taught him well yeah you care oh gosh yeah. see that's the difference you taught that to him yeah and now you look at him as an employee or and he's an employee and you're like i think he's caring too much no he's only following exactly what you did yeah yeah he cares because you cared then we got on someone you ever heard of dave ramsey yeah so um that was another now i'm not hardcore dave ramsey i still he's I, got some fundamentals that work oh gosh yeah and especially for those folks that have that spending problem like you talked with the going to the mall and all that yep. it's very good advice um so then we went cold turkey as far as like any any kind of debt or anything like that so besides those credit cards um we have never borrowed money ever since then mortgage but, house besides that uh, but all cars, cash, um, and even even this store, the second store um, that we opened up was all cash. It's not if, if you're if you want to scale quickly, that's not the route to go. However, it, it's yep. more sure. Yeah. Well, you're taking less risk. You yeah. go get a loan and you go yeah. you you put yourself your neck on the line a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I think it's easier now to do the third and fourth store and take debt mm -hmm. because you now have a record of what the first and second store are doing cash flow wise you have some consistency you have years of seeing the books going okay well the first store does 180 the second store does 200 together i'm doing 400,000 in sales and i've got two years track record to, to gauge what that is yeah i yeah. can now plan ahead for the third store how much debt i can take on yeah um people take on too much debt the first time out like if you would have taken on thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt to start the store the way you wanted and upfitted it with the signs and the logo and a franchise and all these other things, you probably wouldn't have made it. Oh no, I know I wouldn't have. Yeah, it's it's like a cloud above you. Yes, yeah. you know it is. Pay me, pay right. me. Right, and that that's a a lot of the secret to my success in growing was I took loans from each business. So when I started Lightning Mics and then I started Sunstoppers later, years later, mm -hmm. the very first Sunstoppers started to make profit because I was in there tinting windows myself. So the labor of what I was producing was going back into the bank account. Then I had another employee. And when I felt like that employee could take on the responsibility of me, mm -hmm. I took a loan from that business. And Sunstoppers of Matthews loaned Sunstoppers of Charlotte 40, 50 grand. Now, was this all on the books? Was this through a bank? How did you do that? The business had the money in the bank account. Mm. So Sunstoppers Matthews had $60,000, $70,000 in the bank. Mm -hmm. Well, I took a loan of like probably thirty five dollars or 40000 out of the Matthews because we were cash flowing. And then I didn't take a paycheck for three months. And I took the loan from that one business to start the second business. So second business is a completely separate LLC? Separate LLC, okay. separate bank account, separate everything. Okay. And I worked there personally for three months, 90 days, tinting every car and didn't get a single paycheck for mm -hmm. 90 days. So I could get the rent, the power, the utilities, the sign. And then I would start paying a thousand dollars a month back to the loan plus interest to the other store. Mm -hmm. Cause I had to pay that loan back. Then when that loan was paid back and this store was cash flowing, I took a loan from the new store once I had money mm -hmm. or the other store 
and I opened my third store. And then I opened my fourth What's store. What's the point of giving yourself interest back? Because legally, when you take money out of one profit, mm -hmm. you're now loaning that money out. It's now a loan. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay taxes on money that you loan. It's now a loan. So if you have forty or fifty thousand dollars profit, you got to pay taxes on that forty, fifty thousand dollars profit. Mm -hmm. Now it's a loan. Then you can pay it back plus interest. So you're basically able to interest yourself. You're now your own bank. Gotcha. And you're just banking system to yourself. Mm -hmm. But it took a lot of the risk. And all my friends were like, how the hell did you start so many stores? And get?" And I say, bro, I had a parachute on my back. And they go, what do you mean? I go, bro, I could close all these other stores, just like you. Could close your second store, fire your brother, go back to the original store, mm -hmm. do all the cell phone repairs yourself and pay all your bills. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely. It's accurate, correct? Yeah, yeah. So worst case scenario, market crashes, everything in the world goes to shit. You could close everything, go back to your original store, work there by yourself, and pay your bills. Is this correct? Yeah, absolutely. I had the same feeling. Yeah. So I could knew that every time I took two steps forward, I knew I could close all these other stores in a second, take the phone numbers and forward them to my other store, close mm -hmm. them, and go back to my original store, work there by myself with a helper, mm -hmm. and I'd be able to pay all my bills. So I wasn't, to me, taking any risk. I was taking no risk. The risk is not leaving the store that you've lived in for 10 years and five years tinting windows yourself because you're never branching out to try. And when I do business coaching and I go out to other small businesses, the very first thing I tell people is, you know what's holding your business back? The owner, you. Get the hell out of this store, empower your people, and leave. Mm -hmm. And then you go do what you're good at and only make decisions on what you know how to make decisions on and let your staff train them, you know, let them work, let them go do their job. I got hurt. And when I got hurt, I had to start asking for help. And when I started asking for help is when my income went up. Hmm. When I started asking for help, we are so prideful as men that we don't ask for help. Even when we're hurt, we get our feelings hurt. We're financially not doing well. We don't want to go drink beer at the bar and have a pity party and go cry in the corner. Yeah, yeah. But if you're really looking to build yourself, look at yourself and ask for help. Men don't ask for help enough, I don't think. Especially like someone in your position. Who are you going to cry to, Mike? Me? A nine to fiver? <laughs> well, what do you think is going to happen if you, you know, you understand? Even if you were to share you're so limited to who will truly understand you. Right. What'd you expect? You took on the risk. It's not all rainbows and sunshine. Right. And it's, sometimes you just need a vent. Sometimes it rains and you just want an umbrella. It's not, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, what I feel most business owners vent about, you're fortunate enough that you have two locations and you have family working for you. But my thing is, is when you have employees, that you know are not living up to their potential, mm -hmm. that have so much potential. They could produce so much more, but they get so complacent mentally that they reach a plateau of what they want to make a week, mm -hmm. and it's just they shut down. It's like, oh, I made 1500 bucks this week, I'm good, and they don't push any further. So is that nature or nurture? It's, it's like going to the gym and running a mile every day. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you know you can run three, you're, you're shorting yourself. You're not living up to your potential. It's like going to the gym, running a mile every day for five years. Mm -hmm. Have you even tried to run two miles? Have you even tried to run three miles? They don't try. But that, that mental barrier is real. That's why sometimes you gotta put that towel over that treadmill and just run. Yeah, don't look at the clock. Exactly. Yeah. What I did years ago is the guys were taking too long to tend a car. I felt because mm -hmm. I can tell a car fast. So I'm looking at the people going, damn, you're taking two hours. Of I can do that thing in 45 minutes. And they're, I'm looking at the steps and I'm like, all right, they're walking here. They're walking there. They're cutting this film. They're walking to the trash can. I'm just, I just observed. Mm -hmm. I didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, well, if we had the tools right here and we had the plotter right here and we had, I feel like the shops that are smaller, they're more efficient and they mm -hmm. tend the cars faster. The more space you have, like these bigger stores, they have wider stores, two or three cars here. 
they take twice as long to tend a car because yep. they have so much more space. And when you have a small space, you're more efficient. Yeah. I always feel like the smaller stores are more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And they're less overhead. You've been to my Charlotte one. I love it. Yeah. It's simple. They crank them out. It's man. simple, man. And we keep everything in stock. So how did you hire this new employee for your other location? Um, this new location, we've been rotating a couple of employees back and forth. Um, wonderful guys, just life. How did you find them? Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Did it work? Yeah. Really? Yeah. They say, hey, I know how to fix cell phones. I'm going to yeah. come out here and work. We do like a uh, like a month trial. Um, it's a time for them to feel us out. We feel them it's a dating, out. Dating, dating, correct. You're dating. Yeah, and it, there's you can convince me you're good, but then we have to see you produce. Right. Um, and in our industry, we kind of look for unicorns because most of the people that are tech savvy are not very socially developed, if you could put it that way. So right. you have to find someone who's that hustler, that salesperson, but also knows how to do repairs. Um, we. The, the, the uh, setup we have um, works best that way. Bigger stores, you can have a upfront person and somebody in the back. Then, you know, you can get somebody who just stays in the back and the person doesn't have to see them. As you know, everybody you bring on board is the face of your company. When that customer deals with that person, they're dealing with Sunstoppers. Yeah, they're representing you. So they, they have to look good, smell good, present, right. you know, and convince you that they're as good as, you know, as they say they are. There's some guys that just need to be in the back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but you need them. If you can make it work. If yeah. you can make it work. You have the face, put someone else as the face. Yes. And then you yes. get the labor in the back. We're just not big enough for that. But, right. you know, there, there's a place for them too. What's the next plan for you? Are you going to do a third store? Or are you going to? I think so. You, you, you do want a third? Yeah. Are you profitable in the second location? Yeah, actually already, which is crazy. How long you have you have a year? Just a little over a year. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you start that one budget wise? That one we spend, I want to say forty grand. Forty grand. Yeah. So you started the first one with six grand, mm -hmm. yeah. and the second one with forty. Yeah. Look yeah. at you. You're making yeah. too much money now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, this this was right after COVID. COVID treated us very well. A lot of folks were at home, couldn't work. Um, so I can't say we did something right and we're better than somebody else. We were just in an industry that. Unfortunately, we have to deem them essential or not essential, right, 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 which is right. a terrible way to like yeah. classify someone's way to make a money. Uh, but we were essential. So, I mean, kids were just wrecking their iPads. Everyone's at home. They want the latest and greatest gadgets. So we were able to. Um, Do you buy phones and resell them yeah that's that's a big part of your business yes so yes. you go f where do you find these phones do people just say hey i'm selling my phone i bought a new one oh I, that's a huge one um broken phones to them they can't afford to fix the it. phone looks ruined especially if there's lcd damage lines going across they think it's gone all i see is all it needs is a screen replacement right so you can buy five six hundred dollar phones for like 120 dollars you know Fix it and sell it for three hundred. Oh, four hundred. Yeah. Well, your retail, you get to you get to tax a little. <laughs> um, so people come in and actually want to buy used phones. Yes, yes. That's a huge market. Absolutely, and we give and we give lifetime warranties. So if if we sell a device, the only thing we don't cover is physical and water damage. Unless you go running it over with your truck, you get any problems. That's another way of us separating ourselves from the competition is we don't haggle you when you come back and something's glitching. You fix it. We're not looking at you like, did you, like is it really defective? Say less. So now, how fast can you fix a, a phone? Just a, a, a front phone that's broken. There was an iPhone 5C that we used to crank out a lot. Um, I got it down to four and a half minutes. Get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, a new 13, 14. How long? Those we take our sweet time on because there's components there that are calibrated to the motherboard, meaning if you damage it, there's no replacing it. And Apple does that on purpose. Even now, moving forward, if I, if I take two brand new phones of yours, two brand new ones, take the screens, swap them over, put them on, both phones will tell you non-genuine screen detected. Really? Mm -hmm. And that's another way of Apple like trying to take over that repair industry. They work. What do, you, what do you do in that situation? Explain to the customer. Try to educate them. Every one of them. It'll show up and then go away. It'll be in your settings forever. Non-genuine screen detected. So what? The phone still works, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. You just have a message. You look bad. 
<laughs> you put on some crap. <laughs> That's your salvage title. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. There's your. Uh, sorry, bro. Your phone's worth half as much. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's a genuine. Not, it's not OEM. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Even though it is, which so, is crazy. So these screens are actually the same screens that Apple puts back. Yes. Well, we the aftermarket scene has really gone up to where it used to be. Um, the, the aftermarket parts we're able to get are right there with OEM. Okay, so they're um, very Visually, very you can't tell the difference. Right. But what I'm trying to say is even when you do use complete OEM, you do get that message unless you're Apple authorized, and then you get to plug in into a computer, and then the computer will tell that phone, now it's genuine. If you were to give advice to someone in high school who's 18 to 21, what advice would you give them to be an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur yeah what does it take to be an entrepreneur like if you're 18 19 20 and you haven't gone to college and you don't know what future it's not cell phone repair but these kids find something that they're good at what advice can you give someone that is wanting to find something to do for themselves that they, they want to do an entrepreneur ship they want to go and work for themselves mm -hmm. what advice can you give them boots on the ground go and work for someone who you want to be like go Follow work them. for or so go work for someone that you want to be like yes learn everything from them do do the things no one else will do hustle yes and be there early and save as much as possible because you don't have to have a plan to save money it's just when that opportunity presents itself you will be ready in life it's always like that there's always opportunities that come by but you and i have friends that always hit you up hey this came across can i borrow some money you never set yourself up for the opportunity right i've had to learn not to loan anyone money oh man i've i've had multiple people over the years never pay me back right so if you want advice i can give anyone living or listening to this um podcast is this if you are going to loan a friend or someone that you know money, it's not a loan, it's a gift. Just just in mentally, mentally hand that person the money and say, I'm handing this to you as a gift for our friendship mm -hmm. and for I, the value that I see that you still give me in my life. Mm -hmm. And it, you, will re, you will find resentment towards those people. They, they never made an effort, but you will see them go on vacation. Mm -hmm. You will see them go buy things and do things on social media. Yeah. And you will be like, I fucking loaned that dude money and he never paid me back. And then months later, a couple months later, he's out living it up. And you're like, you're out living it up on my money. Yeah. Well, we're wired that way. We're, we always, we always remember the negative. We you, do. You can bring your wife flowers every single day of the week. But you do one thing wrong. And you're reminded. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do for your wife? What do I do for my yeah, wife? Yeah, do you do any kind of um, acts of kindness? Do you do like random acts of kindness, flowers, massages? Do you believe in um, the love languages? Mm, I believe it's it's got value. Have you heard of it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So her is um, uh, deeds, acts. So I have to like, the sexiest thing I can do for her is like wash the floors. Wash the floor. Vacuum the house. Okay, perfect. Do the dishes. Do the dishes. Which sucks, because for me, I, I would, <laughs> you know, I'd rather buy her flowers. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's her, um, that's how she likes Mine to would, feel appreciated. I would rather go wash the car and fill it up with gas. Mm -hmm. Be like, I'm going to go wash the car. I, let me take get the keys to your car. I'll go get it washed at Audubon. <laughs> I'll go freaking go fill it up with gas, and yeah. I'll come home leaving the driveway or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, and the thing is, my wife, compared to me, works full time. I work part time. Well, you got four kids. Exactly. And what's the age of your young ones? What, two? Yes. That's crazy, man. Yes. You yes. got a house full of kids, yes. all under the age of 10. Yeah. Our oldest just turned six. That's insane. I wouldn't trade it for the world. You're not having any more? No, we're not done. It's always the next question. I'm, I'm always on top of it. No, we're not done. You want to have more kids? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Are you going to move? Because you told, told me you might sell your house and move. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, a couple of months ago, we, we just moved. You did? Okay. Unionville, yeah. Okay, because I haven't uh, talked to you since then. So you did sell the house? We put it up for sale, um, expecting just offers. The market was, this was at the peak of the market. Okay. So we put, it, you put up, it up. You put it up for sale when, August? Yes. Yes. Put it up for sale, cleaned the house, 
packed the kids, went to the beach because we were expecting, you know, offers on top of offers. Right. Got one offer for asking like six hours in and that's it. One offer. One offer. Full ask. Full ask for asking price. Three days or two days later, my realtor is like, do you want to counter? I'm thinking, how do you counter asking? Like they're giving you what you want. What are you going to say? No, give me more. So we accept. Um, Right away, we find another house that we'd like. Um, Or this was prior to. So long story short, the day of closing, our buyers are selling their house in the morning. Sure. Taking that money. To close on you. Buying ours. Right. We're taking that money to buying. Yeah, it was like a boom, 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 boom. Every, if if their if, if, if their buyers went through, backed out, you couldn't. yes. So talk about stress, and it all worked out. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and it was at the absolute peak of the market. We didn't time it that way. It just it just turned but out. You had to pay high for the, the the market on the house you bought too. Yeah, but it's fine if you buy it at the same buy and sell at the same time. It kind of evens out. Yeah, you know, that's good. I remember you said you had a lot of equity in your house. And, yeah, and you ended up buying. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Good for you. Yeah. So the next store where you want to put the location, you've got one now in Midland. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, Locust. It's Locust. Mm-hmm. Got it. And um, you got one uptown Charlotte. Where's the next one? Where would you go? I don't know. Wherever wherever God leads us. Um, this one, they found us. I had no idea about Locust. Somebody, how's, that, how's that market out there? It's booming. Good. Now, not Charlotte booming, but it's all the overflow from Charlotte. There's no cell phone repair places out there? No. We, you're, you're it. We got it on lock for like 10 mile radius. Good for you. For now. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. And everybody knows who you are now? We're, we're, we're it's, it takes time to build that relationships and country folks, they talk, you, you know. Yeah. They're yeah. loyal. Yeah. 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 And so the next location is probably going to be, um, Man Hill. I hear Texas is booming. Ah, oh, Texas is booming, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I got room for you down there. I hear. You want to come down there? <laughs> I got a house for you to stay in and everything. You can come stay in Texas. Texas is absolutely booming. Really? And what people don't understand about Texas is is that I fly into DFW. We've got our biggest location there. And they're like, How do you do so much business? I was like, Okay, Charlotte's got maybe a million and a half people, mm-hmm. you know, within a fifty mile radius. There's seven and a half million people within a 40, 50 mile radius. So DFW is seven times bigger than Charlotte. So you have to understand that and put that in some some equations and go, okay, your average income is probably 30,000 more in Texas than Charlotte. Mm-hmm. You have seven and a half million people. So you have seven and a half million people own 1.5 cars. They're all going to want their windows tinted. It's 107 degrees five months out of the year. They are, it's hot, and people have money, and people expect to get their windows tinted. Like in Texas, I'd say 80 to 90% of car owners tint their windows in Texas. In Charlotte, probably 30, 40% people tint their windows. So it's a higher population, but it's also a higher um, awareness. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to go to the beach, you're putting sunscreen on. If you go to New York, you might not put sunscreen on. And I'm only using that comparison is like if you if Charlotte's New York, yeah, you put sunscreen on only in two months out of the year. We learned that one the hard way. <laughs> we learned that the hard way. When but, we moved to Charlotte. <laughs> so you go to Texas, you're putting sunscreen on eight months out of the, of yeah, the year. Yeah, every yeah, day. Yeah. You don't leave the house without sunscreen on. And what I mean by sunscreen is tent. You get in your car, it's hot. You touch your steering wheel, it's hot. Um, so, but yeah, cell phones. So I think you would kill it. You would absolutely kill it in Texas. Maybe, maybe come, come down there and we'll, we'll scout it out go to some, go to some repair stores and do some homework. I need to shadow you a little bit more how you, um, remote manage. That's different. <laughs> you empower people to be you, to make decisions and you give them a card, a credit card, and you put them in charge. Hmm. You have to let go. They own the business. My employees own my business. I don't own the business. I'm just the coach. How long do you know someone is trustworthy of that? I trust everyone until the, until the trust is broken. So everyone is... They're batting 100 the very first day. I have no reason. It's like dating a woman very very first time. I don't care about her past. Mm-hmm. I can only care about from the day I met you forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't care what you did in the past. I don't care who you dated, who you cheated on, who, whatever. It's how you treat me. And how you continue to treat me. And do you still add value to me? Well, I'm sure you still interview them and there's red flags that come up. 
and your conversations? Um, one key component is this. If they're married and have a kid, they're committed. Mm -hmm. Find that. It, that seems to be the winning formula. If you have someone that's single who is 25 to 35, who's never been married, has no intentions of having kids, they're not settled. They're all selfish. Mm -hmm. they, and I'm not saying all, but I'm, in my opinion, they're very selfish. Naturally. Because they're naturally because yeah. 25 to 35, you haven't made a commitment to anyone for a length of time. Yes. Yes. You're dating multiple people here and there. You've lived in a couple different apartments. They're not settled. So mentally, they're quick to make decisions to just bounce and leave you. Mm -hmm. They're not committed. Yeah. They're never going to be. You're going to continue to date. Those are people you date. You just don't marry. Mm. And in business, I feel like your employees or your partners, people, because I consider some of my employees, not some, but a lot of my workers are partners. We're all partners. We all get a percentage of every dollar that comes in the store. So at the end of the day, we all are partners. It's just I run a different part of the business. I took the risk. I got the building. I got the name. I did the website. I do the marketing. It, it, every time they pick up the phone and materials show up, I had to pay for those materials. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had one guy years ago look at me. I don't even know how long it was. He goes, Mike, I never see you around that much. What do you do? I go, what do I do? Okay, can I explain this to you? In a in terms that you clearly understand. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay. I said, when you come in in the morning, does the key that opens the door work? He goes, yeah. Okay. When you come in and hit the power switch, does the power to the building come on? It does. Every day, right? Yep. Does the phone just randomly ring periodically throughout the day? Yes, it does. Okay. When you order materials from the manufacturer, when you run out of materials and you hit order, do they show up? They do. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm doing my fucking job. Yeah. Yeah. So don't ask me what I'm doing. When, when you walk in the door and the key doesn't work or the power doesn't work and you order film and it doesn't show up, then I'm screwing off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You come to work, you do your job, and I do mine. And I make sure that you have the phone ringing. I make sure customers are coming in the door. I'm making sure I'm spending money on marketing. I'm spending money on my website. I'm spending money to make sure the phone service is constantly working. I'm making sure people are reading the emails that are coming in for leads that we can now secure the appointments for the store. And I'm constantly improving my business every single day from behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Constantly. There's a book, it's called The E-Myth Revisited. You heard of it? I've heard of it. Yeah. So it's basically the concept of assuming if I'm good at a trade, therefore I will be good at running a business doing that trade. That's not true. And that's that's exactly what it talks about, is they are completely two separate entities, two separate monsters you got to tackle. 1,000%. So just because you're good at Sounds like a great burgers, book. It is. It is highly recommend to anyone listening. Um, and it kind of helps you distinguish the two where... You cannot run a business and be in the business. So the fact that you're out hustling, making sure the phone rings, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that if you were out there plotting. Correct. Yep. And that's I'm planting seeds. And that's and that's not always a bad thing too. Like, um, not everyone is out to be a go getter, and that's okay. We, we you, if you're not the type that wants to take their risk, find someone who is a risk taker and work for them, and make sure they compensate you, you know, according. So saying all the things that we've said and your advice to an entrepreneur mindseted person is go work for someone you want to be like absolutely if you found that person who was ambitious that came to you and said i want to learn your business i want to learn your trade blah 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 what i try to do mentally is i love those people and then i want to turn around and become an investor mm -hmm. i no longer want to be a business owner I want to be an investor. Yeah. And what I say by that is I'm seeing an opportunity to capitalize on this person's ambition, drive, and determination. And they need me as an investor. They need my brand. And they want to continue to do what I'm doing. Why let that person leave? In the window tinting businesses, mm -hmm. all I hear is 
man, I taught this guy to tent windows, and two years later he left me, and now he's my biggest competitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's your fault? Number one, you didn't pay him what he was worth. Mm -hmm. Number two, you didn't coach him to say, hey, man, if you, what are your dreams? What are your goals? And you kept stealing the limelight. Every day the customers come in, hey, Bob, uh, hey, Bob. And you got John back in the back who's doing all the grinding, all the tinning, and all the work, and all the crap. But he's not getting any recognition from the customers. He's not getting any data boys, not getting any thank yous. And then he builds up resentment towards Bob and says, Bob, screw you, bro. I'm leaving. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So if Bob could have in, empowered John and said, hey, John, this is my customer, Matt or Sam. He's got a couple cars tinted. If I'm not here, see John. I did that. So in my business, when people came in to talk to me, and they go, man, Mike, 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 Mike. Hey, I got this guy Wayne in the back. He's been tenting for a while at my Matthew store. I said, hey, Wayne, why don't you meet Sam? Hey, Sam, if I'm not here, Wayne's my guy. And if he screws up, I'll fix it. Mm -hmm. So I gave the the verification, or no, the, I think it's a verification, but that to the, the validation or the verification, um, the assurance, uh, insurance or assurance to the customer, mm -hmm. my relationship, that if Wayne doesn't take care of you the way you want to be taken care of, I'll fix it. I'll come here, I'll come back, and I'll retent your car if there's something wrong with it. Yeah. And when you transition the ownership to your workers, then the people that you have relationships with, when you're not there, feel comfortable and confident that they can deal with your worker. Yeah, yeah. A lot of owners forget to do that. And then if John says, hey, man, I want to eventually own my own tent shop too. Perfect. Yes. Great. When you come up with $20,000, I'll come up with $20,000. Or you come up with $25,000 in the next two years. Mm -hmm. And when you can write a check for $25,000, I'll write a check for $25,000. And you and I can open up a Sunstoppers, right? down the street or wherever you want to open and we can be partners in the new business and we can be more successful together. Yes. <clears throat> because John's going to go down there and scrape and work out of a little industrial park somewhere and he's going to go grind out a living and he's never going to really do it the way he really wants to do it because I got to teach John how to scale and go, hey man, John, in two years we're going to get you an employee and then we're going to go open another one and we're going to open another one and we're going to do it together Yeah, yeah. Be because I can't keep running them all. And he can't scare you to have someone succeed. You want other people yeah. to succeed. The, you, you can sorry for interrupting. Go ahead, okay. You can learn a lot about even your circle of friends by the way they they react to your success, by the way they react to good news. You know, explain that. It's they're you, not happy for you. Yeah, they're jealous. I I can't say what it is, but. Over years, you kind of learn to pick up on cues, on questions, on, on the way they react to just, hey, rejoice with me. Here's what happened. I'm blessed. And you can tell and you can really separate those folks that want the best or see you as competition. Really? And, and, that, and that is vital to somebody as a business owner. If your employee comes up to you with success, with ambition, and all of a sudden to you, that's, that's a threat. Check your heart, check your heart. It's not in the right place. Yeah. And even the people you, you keep around you pay attention, how they react when you tell them good news. It's good advice. We love hearing bad news. Why? Why do you think people like hearing bad news? They, they did, um, even studies like a newspaper will try to put out only good news tanked. Really? You want to hear the bad stuff. You want to hear the bad stuff. You and I, we're, we're in an industry like, say somebody comes in and we give A1 service. I'm talking someone's plotting, you're out there massaging their feet. Yeah. Phenomenal. You know how many people they're going to tell? Two, statistically. But if they come in and they have subpar quality service, they're yeah. going to tell eight people, statistically. <clears throat> the odds are always against Then us. why does everybody still go back to drive through restaurants <laughs> why does Popeye still exist why is McDonald's even still in business holy shit I don't know how many times I, I don't go to McDonald's but I know years ago I'd go there and it would be like one ketchup it'd be like I got large fries yeah you can give me one ketchup yeah like what is going on yeah but you know Chick-fil-A has got a great model um you know a lot of people either love or hate Chick-fil-A 
but the people that work there are trained properly. And I feel like they're, they're always genuinely well-trained. I've never had my food ever come out the way I didn't order it. I don't ever have to worry about the food being spit on or put yeah. on the garbage or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's always yeah. fresh, it's always cooked now. Um, but they played the long game. They, as, as a company, there's a reason why they are so successful. They, they, you, to own a Chick-fil-A, you got to work for them. I think it's two years. Um, and then you basically, you just get a really good management job. At the end of the day, you don't own that Chick-fil-A. Right, Chick-fil-A owns them all. What's another good thing, now that we talk about them, for future uh, ventures and businesses opening up, opening up around a Chick-fil-A. Because their marketing, you will never be able to afford the kind of marketing and the kind of um, demographic studies they do. If so, you're near a Chick-fil-A, you're golden. That area is bound to do something. I always wanted to open up right next to a car wash. Mm -hmm. And I have one store on South Tryon that is right next to an auto bell. How was that? Kills it. Because everybody comes in and want to get their car washed. Mm -hmm. And then they're walking around watching the guys vacuum their car and they're looking at my tent shop. And then they'll walk over and ask me how much to tent their windows. And they'll literally come out of getting their car washed and pull it in to get their windows tinted. Yeah. So I always said if, if I could build me a, like a car wash, an automatic car wash with like one, two people out there wiping them down, like a mini, mini auto bell, mm -hmm. and then have two bays off to the side with a garage for window tinting. It would be game over. Everywhere there's an auto bell, if I could just build two bay building right there next to it. Because mm -hmm. I mean, on Saturday, they'll wash 300 cars. All I need is three or four or five to tent. <laughs> I'm getting 1% of their drive through you seen the the where they split the um it's like half kfc half taco yeah. bell or yeah. something like yeah. that yeah exactly that's it's like it's like us i've got space at other stores like you should seriously think about coming in some more stores with yeah. Them. yeah 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 the, the the heavy high traffic areas mm -hmm. lake norman is where i think you should go really a lot of money in lake norman bro and a lot of loyalty there too lake norman huntersville denver not denver but like the the what I consider the exit 23 to exit 18, even the North Lake mall area to like exit uh, 33, mm -hmm. that, that whole corridor is just craving for something like this. Recently I started doing uh, like five and 10 year plans. Okay. And that's really helped me in like the big and small decisions. When you have a plan, say five years out, the little decisions, you can always go off of that plan. Does it bring me closer to here or farther from here? Do I need that new pair of sneakers? Do I need to splurge here? Is that gonna bring me closer or farther? Is this truly marketing or am I just using it as, as an excuse? Right. So moving forward, um, yeah, definitely looking to expand and getting back to being frugal and that that. Would you ever look for any investors? I don't know if we need them because of. Do you think the second store? It depends on how, how quickly we wanna scale though. This is true. Yeah. What does it take now, 40 grand to open up a store? No, I kind of went all out. I think I can get by with like 20. You can do a store for 20 grand. I think so. If somebody wanted to open up a store that does cell phone, how fast can you teach them this business and then open a store? And then open us to, okay, text and running is two completely separate things. Text take us about one to two months to train them to do basic repairs that's not board level, anything like that, to train, gosh, at least half a year. So you need six months. Yeah. As an apprentice. I think so. Would you have that person pay you and then go open and then be able to go open up a new store, like a training well, seminar? Why not? Like if I said, hey, Sam, my son is 18. Mm -hmm. He wants to own a cell phone repair store. Yeah. He wants to do what you're doing. Yeah. How much would you charge me to train him for six months? It depends. For you, probably nothing. I, I understand, um, but I'm just saying, in, in, if someone's listening, I'm, I'm only going down this road as, okay, maybe you don't open up a lot more stores. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have an apprentice that comes and works in your store and pays you and mm -hmm. then you help them own a store and get them started because college is so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And if you had a program out there, an apprenticeship program for parents and say, look, my kid's a nerd. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying it's a good thing. Oh, of course. And you're saying, Hey, he kind of sits on computers, you know, he's kind of introverted a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but he loves working on gadgets and watching YouTube videos, and he's a he's a tinker, and uh, and that's what I consider this like a, a, almost like a tinkering. You know, yeah. you got to be able yeah. to yeah. pay attention to details. Sure. And you he's an apprentice for six months. Their mom and dad have got money. They don't. They're not. The kids not going to college. Yeah. 
and you say, okay, for 25 grand, we're going to go open up a cell phone repair store and you want to get a, a, a licensing or some type of money off of the, the relationship. Yeah. And you coach them. Then they buy all their supplies and materials. You mark it up, you know, 20%. Yeah. Well, that's just franchise 101. That's, yeah, but you don't have to become a franchise to do that. Easier if you do it. Yeah, you can. You yeah. can file the, the legal paperwork and become a franchise. Yeah. It goes back to the E-Myth Revisited. It goes back to just right. because you're a tinker doesn't mean you're going to manage other tinkers. Right. You, you understand? But there's a lot of side hustles. I'm sure there's a lot of kids in college. Plenty of money to be made. Side uh, hustle. Oh, gosh, yeah. If you're in college right now, if you're looking to make extra money, go on Facebook Marketplace, offer up, um, and just see what phones are going for. Find a cracked phone. Um, it doesn't take Fix much. Fix them to yourself. Take, yes, pull up a YouTube video. Um, you're going to screw up a couple of them, but it, that's fine. It, it, you can make at least 100, 200 bucks per device. In college, that's big. That's a, you know, you week of big burgers, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, definitely money to be made. Uh, the problem is, is when you start having overhead and employees with payroll and right. all that, then you need a system going. Just for yourself, you can make some pretty good side money. Yeah, yeah. flipping devices. Love it. Got a new house, second location, and uh, what, have, what have you done in the second location this first year? Do you have the, the numbers there? I don't, no. <laughs> you can ask my wife. She does the taxes. That's cool. Yeah. But you're making money. Yes. yes you're doing well. Yes, yes. And you are blessed. Blessed. Highly favored. And do you work out every day? Except Sundays. But you go to the gym every single day. I do, yeah. Do you think that has anything to do with your success? I think part of it is the, the habit building and holding yourself to certain standards. I think so. You're paying yourself every day. You're trying to improve. So yeah. anyone that goes to the gym every single day is is constantly trying to better themselves or improve in some way. Yeah. What do you think it does for you mentally? Some days, honestly, like people said, it's just therapy. It's just your time. Um, it's not about the weight you're pushing around. It's, you know, it's just, you know, it's a constant in your life. What's so many unsure, with so many things you don't have answers to, you know when you get there, 225 is going to feel like 225. You know, it, it's something that's always constant. A lot of the successful uh, entrepreneurs I've had on this podcast have all said they've started their day off at the gym. Yeah, yeah. Do you hear that a lot with other small business owners? Absolutely. It's a common thing. And it, weightlifting is not for everybody. Um, you I can recommend do yoga. You yes. can ride your bike. You can go swimming. Anything to get your blood moving. Yes. Yes. Right. That's do you drink I coffee? Pre-workouts. You do pre-workouts? I do. I drink coffee later in the day. Does it uh, mess with your nerves? Does it give you anxiousness or any kind of anxiety to, to take those? No. Well, certain ones. Um, I did kind of clean it up and try to find like all natural. They taste like chemicals. They're disgusting. But um, like there's one called Naked. Naked Energy. You ever heard of it? No. And it's just pure, just like active ingredients. There's no like fillers, no like tasting. It's disgusting. But um, it's just one way to kind of get me jump started. I was on those a little bit and I go back and forth. You know, I think they make my blood pressure higher. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to be very careful not to get my blood pressure too high. So I'm trying to limit when and how much. So if I was doing a pre I was doing half as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would do half a scoop instead of one scoop. So I try to scale back uh, a little bit off of it. Um, but what I have found, my buddy Chris Hardy, uh, when we travel together, so I'm, he would pop a five-hour energy, uh, the little things. And they're pretty natural. Sure. And um, those seem to be okay for me. Like, like, like pre-workout? Just to pop one of those right before I go and, and, and get a little bit of that. It's natural. Um, seems to be very easy to just, boom, take it in a shot. And then 15 minutes later, you kind of feel alert. Um, as long as you stay hydrated and get it out of your system, right. it's fine. The hydration is key. Yeah. I've, um, I've built a barrel sauna at my house, <laughs> and we do cold plunging now. Yeah, I love that. Yes. It's so um, good. And that helps get a lot of the stuff out of your body. I love that. You know? Yeah. So you bought a barrel, mm -hmm. and you filled it with ice? No, no. The, the sauna is a barrel. So it's a big barrel that sits six people comfortably. Like a Really? Yeah, it looks like a, like a whiskey barrel. Um, you open the door, you get in, you get it's this? electric. Uh, they sell them online. Yeah, it's, it's proper. Don't, don't, don't let the name fool you. It's a, it's a proper sauna. Um, it gets hot. Oh gosh. Yeah. And in, in my culture, you know, we cook ourselves in there. And then you go get out of that and then mm -hmm. go to a, what do you cold plunge in? And, and, uh, got like a, um, what is it? A trout? What is it called? Where, where horses drink from? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, trough. Trough. So, yeah, so just fill that up with water, ice. <coughs> Bless Excuse you. me. Yeah. Um, fill that up and just do like cold therapy. And you have ice. You just throw ice in it? Yes. Like a whole bag? Well, right now the weather's really nice. You don't even have to do that. But yeah, we we'll do like you just cold, 10 like bags, fill it up. So 10? Oh, gosh, yeah. And how long do you sit in it? Like 10 to 20 minutes. No. You got, well, you have to get used to it. At first, you have this panic. You, you're going to have to control your breathing. Second, third session in, man, you're chilling. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's an art. Like, I talked to my old man. Um, like, is this nature or nurture? Do, do I want to go to the sauna because I've done this since I was little? Or is something in me that's craving this, like, detox? You're, yeah, you're sweating out and then cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's like your, your body's going through a reset. Oh, gosh. I like it. I yeah. need to try this. Mm -hmm. and, and another benefit is you're no longer scared of the cold as much. I used to go to the um, cryo. I used to go to cryo and uh -huh. I'd stay in there and I would, I would do three sessions in a row. How like, cold does it get? Uh, I don't know. Negative, whatever they, 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 you go in a thing that freezes you and it's cold. Yeah. And, um, you wear like some mittens on your hands and like feet mm -hmm. and you go in there and I, it would be like three minutes and I'd be like, um, I need to go again. I need to go again. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, uh, no, you can't go again. I'm like, I want to go again. And my body temperature, they would shoot me cause I'm so hot that it takes three times for it to get down to what normal people would get more. So they track your core temperature. Core. Mm. They want to figure out where your, your temperature is. It's that kind of stuff. It's th these these things that are just now getting like on the mainstream, like the cold plunges. This is thousand year old medicine. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is how folks survived. You know, th there, there was no antibiotics. Speaking of which, um, it's important to keep track of your gut health too. To stay on top of the probiotics and make sure um, that you listen to your body, it'll it'll tell you what you need if you just listen. What do you do? Well, we do like fermentation. Like we buy raw milk, we ferment it. You ever heard of kefir? Uh uh. Okay. You ever heard of kombucha? Nope. You never heard of kombucha? No. I gotta get you some, man. What is that? Kombucha. It's it's there's like a scoby. It almost looks like a jellyfish. Um, and you feed it like, uh, like teas or something like sugars and it ferments, um, similar to how you ever heard of kwas? No, Michael, you got it. It's been a while since you've been over our house. Um, <laughs> similar to how you make beer. Okay. Beer's fermented yeah, 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 with, with yeast. So these are just different, uh, fermentations. Got it. Your, your gut has billions of bacteria in it. It's important to feed them properly that things so that you have a healthy gut because most of modern day illnesses start from the gut we call it a bad diet but really you got to keep track of that what type of things are good to put in there for your gut um food wise if you pickle anything pickle yes really but it's got to be the real stuff um uh, did your mom ever jar like vegetables <laughs> We've, we've used to can, like my grandma used to can green can. beans and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So that's already like pre-digested already. It's really good for you. Um, it, with, with kefir, it's live bacteria. So it, it's like with people suffering some from like, uh, skin, um, conditions, um, anything really hmm. it, it's, it's good to stay on top yeah, of you'll it. You'll have to send me a link. Thousand year old medicine, man. Send it to me. Yeah. Let's make it happen. Yeah. What else you want to talk about, man? You enjoy this? This is nice having you on. I do. It, this is nice. It's kind of nice to step away and just talk just to chill. a friend. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool, man. You have a great story. You've got two locations and your smartphone repair. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to reach you, how do they reach you? Just Google smartphone repair in Charlotte. Google smartphone repair. That's, that's on you. I wanted to name it something else, but Mike Burke said, when someone Googles you, you want to be on top of the SEO and name yourself. What was the name you wanted to come up with? Tech smart. Tech smart. And you're like, what is that? I'm like, you're not fixing my damn computer. You're not coming <laughs> to my house and fixing my internet. Yeah. You know, I have a marketing degree from college and I was going out after I sold cars and tinted windows. I went and actually did marketing for a couple of years mm -hmm. and I sold marketing to lots of different companies. And the one thing that I kept repeating um, to small business owners, large business owners. I mean, I was doing TV ads for Mercedes Benz dealerships. I was doing print ads for Pella windows. Um, 
I was I had very large clients that were spending money with me, mm -hmm. and you would see such inconsistency in their brand, and you would see large companies doing multi million dollar sales, and there's just so much inconsistency. And I would sit there, and they would want to wrap a vehicle or something, and they would want to gaudy it up with mm -hmm. whatever crap they could, you know, put on there. And I'm like, well, if you can't see it from ten feet away, riding down the road at sixty miles an hour, the three rules of advertising. The, the three rules, who you are, what you do, and how to get a hold of you. That's it. If your name says what you do, you're going to kill it. Two birds with one stone. Sun stoppers. What do you think we do? <laughs> Brew coffee? I don't know. <laughs> We're a coffee shop. Smart phone repair. What do you think you do? Mike, this is how I answer the phone. Smartphone repair, this is Sam. And once a day, somebody asks, hey, y'all fix phones? <laughs> I'll tell you, man. That's no, the... no, we brew coffee. What, yeah, can, what can I do yeah, for you? Yeah. Oh, sorry, this is Starbucks, man. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to tell you, we serve coffee. Hey, we fix phones? I don't know, bring it in, we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. I saw a YouTube video. That's awesome, man. But why is the world so ignorant? It, are we the, are we thinking so fast that we just forget to do cognitive thinking and actually really think things through before we talk or do people just blurt out and talk and say whatever are they or are they socially awkward to that person basically is like i want to make sure that i called the right number mm -hmm. like is this smartphone repair do you fix phones here mm -hmm. because they're not listening to what you said when you answered the phone. Sure. They're not listening to you. Because if they did listen to you, they would have heard smartphone repair, but they didn't. All they heard was Sam. Yeah, yeah, at the at, at the end of the day, all they heard was Sam. Mm -hmm. Smartphone repair, Sam. Oh, Sam, do you fix phones? So well, how did you find her name on Google? <laughs> what is it called? <laughs> but that's back to your point. Um, I, th I think a lot has to do with, with the electronics and social media. Yeah. Um, recently, my wife and I, we watched like a documentary on Amish people, um, Meta Knights and all them. And it was just interesting to see how they would gather at a table and just have genuine conversations. You can, it's almost like, like going to like back in time and seeing how folks used to communicate, how you used to look in the eyes, go off of social cues and communicate without having something in front of your face. Right. You know, even, even, even communicating, right. And say, I, I kept my phone here. I didn't touch it. I didn't look at it, but how would you feel if my phone was right here? Would you feel like you're the most important person to me at that time? If your phone was there? Yeah. Well, my phone's right here. Well, but it's say if it was like this and I kept looking at it. No. Would you feel like you're the most important person to no, me at that I'd time? No, I feel like I'm sharing the space with that phone. Exactly. Exactly. So it was very interesting to see kind of how, how they go back and have, have that raw communication. Right. And it, it also comes down to like um, conflicts, how well you deal with folks that disagree with you. You know, I, I have to give credit where it's due on, on your ability to have such big circle of friends with whom you disagree on a lot. Like you and I, you know, we, we can go pretty long on things we disagree on, sure. but to find that common ground and agree to disagree in a diplomatic way, it's almost like an art nowadays. It's so rare. I have to be very careful. Um, the older I get, I'm about to turn 50 in two Sheesh. weeks. Sheesh. Come on. Was that out loud? Sorry. It's all right. I still look pretty good. <laughs> um, but no, I'm about to turn 50 years old, man. And, and, you know, I'm an outgoing personality and I like to joke tease I call it locker room talk I don't know if that's the right words to mm -hmm. say but I grew up playing sports so men women doesn't matter I always feel like there's a sense of picking on certain people like if you're you're cutting up or picking on somebody but it's done with an open heart it's done with no ill intent mm -hmm. it's to create a lighter mood in the room sure and I feel over the last 10 years, maybe five, I've got to be very careful who I can engage with that way because we're a very sensitive society now that I can't joke and tease and cut up the mm -hmm. way I used to. 
20 years ago. Sure. And I feel like females or women, whatever, mm-hmm. are a lot more sensitive to any engagement at all, like even basic conversation of invading their space, um, feeling like they're groped or being hit on. Mm-hmm. I have to be very careful to to not engage in a certain manner to where a woman feels offended. This has happened to me a few times unknowingly. Mm-hmm. And then I hear back people tell me, hey man, when you were talking to so-and-so, whatever, you know, you, you made her feel very uncomfortable. And I'm around three other women that are associates or friends or people that I'm aware of. And none of them said anything except one would call me back a week later and say, hey, you know, Samantha was you know, very offended by what you said. I'm sure. Like, I'm like, she was? Like, why didn't she right then and there turn around and say, hey, what you just said is unco- making me feel uncomfortable. And then I can correct it and not know to do that again. What happens is people bottle this up. They keep it. Conflict avoidance. And they just don't want to have, Yeah. they, they want to avoid it. Yeah. But how do you fix it? What I'm saying is one that has no ill intent, that is just a jokester and being around people, being happy-go-lucky and mm-hmm. wanting to be the light of the, the, the area of the, and making everybody happy. How do you fix that if you don't know you need to fix it? What I'm saying is that problem is going to continue to happen if, if I don't know how to address it at that moment. Mm-hmm. So if women really want to have a voice and they really want to make a difference, when someone does something, say it right then and there. Don't hold it in. Don't wait two weeks. Don't turn around and tell somebody else. And I feel like the South, because I'm from the South, is very different than the North. Mm-hmm. I now have a lot of friends globally, internationally, and a lot of friends from up north. And I'm at, just say, a big party with a lot of people up north. And we'll be cutting up, shooting shit. Mm-hmm. There'll be some girls there. And that girl from the north will say, hey, listen, I like you. I don't appreciate what the hell just came out of your mouth, and yeah. you better change your tone. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yes, ma'am, I'm so sorry. We're still cool. We're still friends. We still hang out the rest of the time that we're there. But I know that there's a line now of what I said that's now going to cross with that person. And she's making it very aware to me. Hey, I didn't like that. Don't say that shit again. And I think that's what happens in today's societies. We're so sensitive to not ever say anything because we don't want conflict. Mm -hmm. We don't want, we want to go bitch to our friends and sit in a corner and complain. But, But how do we ever fix the problems if we don't know there's a problem until it's too late? And then that person now, you feel awkward getting around that person ever again because you now know you offended them or hurt their feelings or said something that made them feel uncomfortable. So now you're weird. The, the air in that, that space is now weird. Sure. Do you ever find yourself in those situations or do you ever think since you're blunt? <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah. Do you? Yeah, you do have to. But it, it, you only learn that with years. As you know, right? You learn to pick up on those cues um, with with age. God gives you wisdom. You're able to see, pick up on those sensitive folks. They're always going to exist. South, north doesn't matter. You're always going to have those people that you have to. Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to say tiptoe around, but you can't be as blunt. You can't roughhouse them like you do others. You've got kids. My two boys, polar opposite. My two boys are way opposite. Yes, one. You can talk a certain way, and another one. It's true. My my daughter, one, it doesn't matter what you say, she's good. Another one, if I just look at her too harshly, yep. that's enough. Yep. And it, that comes with, with, I guess, time. Yeah. You learn. Yeah. You know, I um, just constantly, like you said earlier, my goal every day is to become a better version of myself every day. Mm-hmm. Somehow, some way, more knowledgeable, more experienced, and going to the gym, stronger, mm-hmm. leaner, better health. Like every day I'm making, if it's a half of 1%, if it's a 1%, over 365 days, how many more percent this year am I going to be better than I was last year? Mm-hmm. That, that's all. As long as I'm constantly trying to inch, inch, inch a little bit forward. You asked me earlier, what am I getting out of this podcast? Yeah. And what's the big picture? The big picture is, is multiple things. One is 
I'm an anxious person. I'm very anxious. Mm -hmm. um, and I have nervous energy and I'm hyper. And it's hard for me to sit still for a very long period of time. Like I'm fidgety with my fingers. You've probably seen me mess with my hands. I'm always kind of doing something. Well, what this podcast ultimately has done for me is allowed me to listen. I don't like to listen. <laughs> I want to be the guy just talking, talking, talking because in my brain, my brain works. And I'm going to say this. I'm driving at 100 miles an hour when the rest of the world's driving at 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why everyone can't catch up. So I have to blurt out all these things that I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, well, you guys are just going slow. Mm -hmm. And I'm going at, at normal speed. And I have to realize that I gotta back it down to about 40 miles an hour and let everybody catch up to 40 miles an hour. And that's really where everybody should be driving. Sure. So the podcast has allowed me to listen and learn things uh, about you, about everyone that comes on. I read a book today for an hour, and it's the book of Sam. My oh, man, that's a good way to put it. Yep. So where do I ever get the opportunity to sit down and read that book for that day for an hour, or an hour and a half, or two hours? I took time out of my schedule to value you enough to read your book. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what I'm getting out of this the most is I now have read the book of Sam mm -hmm. and I have not, there's more chapters to be written, mm -hmm. but at least I have a very good understanding of who you are, what made you who you are and what you stand for yeah, and where you want to go. And I think that's just very important to me. That's um, needed. It's needed. Yeah. For my self growth. Cause I always think I'm the most important person in the room. And when I'm interviewing you, you're the most important person in the room to me i'm only adding a rebuttal to what ultimately i'm trying to get out of you because i'm going to read your book i'm not worthy you are <laughs> yes thank you so much for coming on the show my thank man. you for having Did me. you enjoy this absolutely it's it's fun it's it? been an honor it's super yeah. cool man yeah yeah you're you're i'm not saying you're a pupil or a student but man you have listened to all of my advice you call me randomly out of the blue to how would you handle this situation? And I'm just going to say that I'm a big brother to you. You're my fiscal father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a big brother, man. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. And uh, keep doing your thing, man. And keep inspiring other people. Keep giving and keep smiling and being the, the great man that you are. Thank you, Mike. You're the man. Thank you. Thanks, brother. <laughs>